You know Dave Weaver, he is a sports handicapping expert, wagering guru, fan duel, TVG, a guy who I've watched for many years as someone that really enjoys horse racing, and I'm so excited. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio, to dive into his career and point out some of the milestones. Dave, first of all, I've seen that your daughter is beginning this incredible TV career already, <laughs> and she's still very young. And she's got the Sophie Cinch that she's done with you and where she makes her picks as far as horse racing is concerned. What can you learn from her on-air demeanor <laughs> that uh, you take to, for yourself? Yeah, I, I think she learned it all from me, first of all. So <laughs> let's let's get that straight. Um, but if people aren't familiar with uh, what's happening here is obviously when the, the pandemic hit and um, COVID-19 came last, uh, maybe beginning of March, uh, our broadcasting took place in the TVG studios in LA and um, that they no longer would allow us to go in to the studio and have people in there. So they, they made everybody do television from home. And one of the benefits of that is you know, your kids are walking around and your wife's in the kitchen making uh, dinner after she's done her job and, and supporting me doing mine. And Sophie said, Dad, what about me? You know, maybe can I come on TV? I said, yeah, let's make a little segment for you. We called it Sophie Cinch and she would pick a horse every night. And for whatever reason, her horse would always win and mine would lose. So she had this big following because she was winning every single time, it seemed like, anyways, that she picked a horse that would somehow find a way to win. And I'm the biggest loser there is when it comes to picking uh, horses. So people took a real liking to seeing that the six-year-old daughter was just schooling her, her dad at handicapping horses. It was pretty fun. So people have taken a liking to her. TVG took a liking to you early on, and I've, I've followed your story as far as you started as a researcher, and then there was an opportunity that was thrown your way where you sort of were like the last person in the building, and they needed to bring you on the desk more or less, and what do you think they saw in you after that initial debut that convinced them that, look, we like Dave, we like what he does on the air, and we think this is a good future for him, at, not just as a researcher, but as a guy who can be in front of the camera. Yeah, I think they always knew that I knew what I was talking about um, behind the scenes, but it's a little different when you have to be oh, on camera and keep a conversation going, sometimes with yourself, sometimes with, with other people. But I, I honestly don't know because that was probably maybe three or four months before I got a chance to do it again. So it's not like the next day they gotcha. said, Dave, you're going to be one of our regular broadcasters from here on out. It's just kind of one of those deals where if you start at the bottom, whatever job you're in, and I've kind of always been an overachiever in anything that I've done, whether it be in sales or uh, in at, at TVG, but I've seemed to always work my way up. Just I guess there's a little bit of luck in being in the right spot at the right time, but just keep working hard. Be friendly to people. Um, you know, if, if they like you, there's a better chance that you're that you're gonna get a second opportunity than if you didn't appreciate it, maybe. And you know, I just kind of made it known that hey, if you do need me again, that was pretty fun. I, I think that it's something that I would want to do because there might be some people that get forced into the situation. They do it because they were asked to, and then they said that. I don't want to do that again. And I, I made myself open to the idea that if, if it happened again, I would do it. And then I think it was either somebody called in sick or we, we expanded our coverage a little bit. We used to do a radio show. We were on seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. There were times when we'd go off the air while there was still racing going on because that was just our block of, okay. of coverage. But we would do radio shows and we would do, I think, on Mondays and Tuesdays. And I started to pick up a couple hours here, a couple hours there. And before long, I was a I was an everyday guy, but it wasn't like it happened overnight. You call yourself an overachiever, and when I think of being an overachiever, I think of you know having perfectionist tendencies. So you you might go back to your early TV days and say, you know, why did I say that, or why did I do that, or you look at what you are now as someone who's so polished and refined. But what do you think you did better in those early days on television? then you're giving yourself credit for. I don't think it was anything about, you know, 
trying overly hard or, or being a perfectionist or going back and watching and saying, oh, why did I say that? Or why did I say this? Actually, I didn't want to watch. I just never really went back and critiqued myself. Mm -hmm. And honestly, nobody from TVG really ever, you know, pushed me and said, you need to do this, or you need to do that. They just let me kind of be who I am. And I think that's really what worked is just, I just, I am who I am. You know, when I, when I get on TV, I don't put on this fake persona where I try to be somebody that I'm not. I'm just a, you know, happy go lucky guy that does, I like to bet and I like to play the horse. And I think that helps too, because people can relate to me that I'm, I'm just like you, you know, I, I play the horses. I don't win that often. Maybe you're better than me. I don't care. I don't have an ego as to, I think I'm the best handicapper in the world. I know I'm not, I'm one of the worst and I'm okay with that, but I, you know, I'm just kind of thinking of myself as a, a man of the people. I'm just like, I, I like to go to the racetrack. You like to go to the racetrack. If you see me at the racetrack, we're probably going to have a beer together anyways. It's, you know, I just try to be myself. And I think that's from day one, I, I've always not wanted to be somebody who I wasn't. I guess that could be the best answer probably. How about day one of TVG? You were there during their early infancy stages to comparing to what it's become and morphed into and grown today what are some of the glaring changes that you've seen over the years it's been incredible um you know we've gone through many different ceos many different corporate uh, umbrellas originally we were owned by gemstar tv guide basically mm -hmm. um back in you know 1999 when we first started and then we kind of morphed into uh betfair uh and then betfair and patty power a huge gaming company um, in London, they merged and now we're owned by a company called Flutter, which is basically Betfair, uh, Patty Power. And they basically made a merge with FanDuel. Timing is I think somewhere around four years ago, maybe. Oh. And to me, that's the best thing that ever happened because the the, the, the current structure and the, the, the management, the company that we work for is just so, it's awesome. Um, the, 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 you know, just, I love sports anyway. So the fact that we're associated with, with FanDuel and now sports betting is coming around and that's something that I want to definitely be a part of along with horse racing, but it just seems like our, our current, um, you know, attitude around TVG and, and being a part of FanDuel is, is, is better than ever. So we've come a long way in, in, in 21 years and I've had, um, many different owners. Um, uh, but the one that we have right now is, is certainly the best. And I'm not just saying that. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, for sure. And the association with FanDuel gives you the opportunity to talk more than horse racing. You know, you're, you're, you're doing shows on, on football and, and other sports as well. So how much of a thrill is that for you to, to step outside what, you know, for a long part of your career was more or less centered towards horse racing and then to now have sort of a full palette of sports to talk about and engage in with the consumer? It's incredible. Um, this year, our show is called More Ways to Win. We just focused on football. Um, last year, we were a little bit more year round where we would do basketball during basketball season and hockey and baseball. But this year, we, we made a, a, a commitment to just do one show a week and make it strictly on the NFL. And it, it was fantastic. Uh, we went from the preseason, which there ended up not being one, but we still did shows four weeks before the, the season started and then went all the way through the playoffs and the Super Bowl. We're taking a bit of a break right now. But I think we're going to come back and probably do something with March Madness, I would imagine, maybe sprinkle in the NBA All-Star game and then start to figure out, you know, what we want to do um, with, with that show. It's a little bit up in the air right now, but um, I love it. Uh, just talking about horse racing for 20 years does get a little bit tedious. I could show up at the racetrack and not have done, you know, one iota of research and I can do four hours of great television. And I know the horse, I know the jocks, I know the trainers. That's not happening on this show. You know, I, I need a good two days to study and, and really figure out what my talking points are going to be, who the key players are that are out, who the key players are that are improving, I think are going to have big games. It's way different than the, than the normal workload that I normally would do with horse racing. Not that I don't study a little bit, but it's a way different thing for me. And I, I really want to know 
as much about sports as I do about horse racing. I've been a sports fan for my whole life. And I know probably more, way more than the average person. But when you're going out and talking about it and people are somewhat trusting you that you're the expert and, you know, the information you're given is correct. I have to be right. We're talking with Dave Weaver, TV star for TVG FanDuel. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. Yeah, how does the research compare from what you're doing and what you have done with horse racing to those two days, say, that you will devote yourself to to studying football and the intricacies of every specific matchup that you're going to look into or all the different factors that play into making your decision on whether it's a prop bet or, or whatever betting line that, that you're trying to attack. And I'm, I'm not so much talking X's and O's and, you know, you know, about the game I'm talking about betting too. So I'm a little bit more about certain trends. You know, the Lakers have gone over in six to their last seven games when they played at Sacramento, things like that, where, where trends a lot of times will hold true. Of course, you have to look at the current rosters and the current way that they're playing as well. But a lot of times just history will repeat itself uh, in, in sports betting. But the, the key is knowing where to get all this information. So as a horse racing guy, you got the daily racing form, you have Equibase, you have certain spots where you can go and know that this is where you learn about how the horse has been performing. For me, it's been a learning curve finding which websites, you know, have uh, the, the historical information as far as betting goes. And it's been a little bit of a deeper dive for me to, to have to find, nobody's telling me this is where you go. I'm, I'm doing it all on my own. So it's been a great learning curve. And I think I found a couple of uh, great spots to, to find some nuggets on, on the football side. Um, Pro football reference is a great database where you can go back and find so many different um you know, levels of, of information on players that go back to the history of whenever the game first started, you know, many, many, many years ago. But um, that's one that during football season, I definitely rely on a lot. What are you more successful at picking winners when it comes to horse race handicapping or picking winners when it comes to being a part of an ownership of a thoroughbred? Uh, well, that's only been few and far between. <laughs> so, and, and a couple of those, I just kind of grabbed on the coattails of some other people. So the, the few that I've been involved on my own didn't really work out all that well. I would say handicapping them and picking them to win on a given day has, has worked out better than, uh, than me selecting horses uh, over the long haul to own. It's a tough game, but if you do get that diamond in the rough, there's, uh, there's a lot of money to be made and a lot of fun to be had, you know, getting to go to the races and that's coming back. A lot of tracks still, there are no fans, but that day is going to come again where you can get out there with your friends and have a great day at the racetrack. Will that day come again well, when we will hear you as a track announcer? In 2016, <laughs> you did Delta Downs, and I listened to the call last night, and I was like, this guy is such a natural. It was pretty fun. Um, that, that was, yeah, it was back uh, on Delta Jackpot Day in wow. Vinton, Louisiana, a small little town. It takes a while to get to, and you're just going through nothing, and then all of a sudden there's a racetrack there. Uh, and a pretty cool little racetrack. And it was a long weekend for the track announcer, Don Stevens. And there were a lot of races that day too, I think 12 or 13. And his voice was just starting to go, you know, and it was the last race of the night. And I sort of pitched myself a little bit, okay. uh, you know, like uh, nudge, nudge. Hey, yeah. Don, if you want me to come up and because I was down in the paddock, we were doing back and forth. Um, I was working for TVG, but he was part of the show. And uh, like, hey, you know, you know, if you really want me to come up and call that last race, I would do it for you. Um, <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, why not? You know, um, so the fact that he invited me up there was the, the first awesome thing of it. And then the fact that it went pretty well, too, um, what was so cool. Uh, my my heart was beating, just really? pounding because, you know, and I'm on TV at that point, 15, 20 years, probably. And, you know, I don't get too nervous um, when I'm, when I'm doing TV just cause it's old hat, but calling a race is just, it was so different because I don't know, like these guys memorize these horses. I basically had the program here and I'm looking around and it's wow. calling the names off the program. You know, I didn't memorize the horses like a track announcer would, but I just didn't know, like, am I just going to totally mess this up or can I just get through it? And I thought it were, I thought at the end, I'm like, wow, that was so cool. I thought I did a pretty good job. Yeah, I think that this is a little, little side gig that you should more compliment <laughs> into your repertoire in horse racing. 
what's the longest you've been on the air at, at like at one stretch? Yeah. Um, so, well, yesterday I was on for five hours, um, which is not a big deal, but that was pretty, pretty much consecutive. But the longest that I've been on and uh, me and Mike Joyce went down to New Mexico, Rio so downs. It's probably 15 years ago. We used to go every year for the all American futurity and the all American futurity trials, which is they had all these horses that race and only the 10 fastest get in. So they separated into about 25 different races and they did it all in one day. So we started like 10 in the morning and got done it whenever the sun went down, there's no lights there. So it's probably, you know, nine hours. I don't know, but it, it wasn't nine hours of constant talking. I mean, you know, they would come to, they were, it was basically like remote hit. They would come to us. We do a race, we'd send it back, but we did forget to put suntan lotion on. We were absolute lobsters at the end of that day. We were just fried red rookie. We were young kids like, ah, this is going to be great. And then like nine hours later, like, what are we doing? I'd seen something that you would also, you've done eight hour shows or, or, or something also. So nine. Wow. And, and a five hour show is like nothing. A four hour show for you is just business as usual. <laughs> We're talking with Dave Weaver. I'm Brian Fenley wrapping it up here with the handicapping star with FanDuel and of course TVG. And kind of what was the most unsuspecting bet, most lavish bet as well that you fit where it's one of those that just got you hooked and you didn't think you were going to make it. You didn't think you were going to hit it. And you did. It was creative. Uh, the, well, the, the, let's just talk about, you know, dollars. The The biggest bet that I hit, and I split it with a with a good friend of mine that's also on the air, Todd Shrupp. And this is dating ourselves to say that this is our biggest bet. And it's, you know, 18 years ago is pretty sad uh, testament to why we haven't hit anything bigger since then. But we we <laughs> we took down the whole pool at, at Los Al. Uh, um, one night during the champion of champions so back then th the pools now are like a couple hundred thousand back then the pool was like 35,000, I think, but we were the only ticket that had it. So that's still always kind of a, a nice thing where you can say, Hey, we were the only ones on the planet that were able to put together these four winners and pick four. And, uh, and when we split the pool, it was like 35,000 or something, but I know most horse players, um, have hit for a lot more than that for whatever reason, I can't hit that huge, huge jackpot pay to have friends that have hit pick sixes for 600,000 and 300,000 and, you know, massive scores. But mm -hmm. for me, that, that would be the biggest. And I'll, I still remember it. Cause it was it, the coming down to the last race. We knew there, this, this horse would pay the whole pool and we got, it, it was, it was a good feeling. It, it must've been. And you, you're not giving yourself enough credit. You, you have hit a whole lot of winners over the years and people adore your, your, abilities they also adore your on-camera demeanor you know you're like you said you're very relatable very personable and anybody would want to come up and have a drink with you you know that's just sort of the, the welcoming demeanor that you have my final question for you is what's the driving force behind your push to to make it in this business to rise in this business and to be successful to be well received and yeah to be to be successful I'm just kind of, I guess, taking advantage of being in the position that I'm in and, and making sure that I don't take it for granted. I mean, considering where I started to be able to, to do this for a living and get paid to go and talk about sports or horse racing and get to travel too and go to tracks and, you know, travel the country and be able to meet a lot of cool new friends and people, you know, around the country has been great. And every day that I do it, I never say, oh, man, I, I think I want to do something different. I, I just love the opportunity to be able to do it. So I, I think I just need to stay appreciative of um, knowing that this is what I get to do. It's great that I, I have a job that I love. And I know it's not something that is very common uh, in this world. A lot of people are doing things that they wish they weren't. And uh, I'm lucky to say that I'm, I'm doing something that I absolutely love. So I just want to take that each and every day. And, you know, whether it's going to advance me into a, a higher position or I'm doing this the rest of my life, I'm content with that. You know, I have no aspiration to, to do anything that, than what I am doing right now. And that's have fun every single day. So it's all good. And I think it's apparent that you're having fun on set. You, you just you radiate that sort of energy that is infectious for the listeners and the viewers and, and why they gravitate towards you and why I'm so grateful for a few minutes of your time looking at your career. Dave Weaver, I'm Brian Fenley. Dave, thank you so much, man, for spotlighting some of the, the 
ins and outs of your career and what makes you who you are and why you've become such a, a dominating force in the industry. Congrats on what you're doing as well, Brian. Keep up the good work.